Hello and welcome to lecture 2 in Motion in One Dimension in Phys 1104. In this lecture we're going to look at position and displacement and we're almost going to make it to velocity. We'll get as far as speed. I want to point out a few things about positions and displacements. First of all, positions, we already know, point from the origin to the location of the object, whereas a displacement always points from some initial location to some final location. And the other thing is that we think displacements are going to be more useful to us because when we move our coordinate system, all our position vectors change, but our displacements don't. Right? I'm also going to point out a few issues of notation. I'm going to use r for positions, not x, so that we don't mix it up with x components of positions. More about components in a moment. And notice that the displacement is indicated with a delta, which suggests that it's a change. So that's something we'll need to talk about. Before we go any further, let's just spend a little bit of time talking about vectors. We're actually going to be able to go a surprisingly long way in this course without dealing with the full rules of vector algebra, but we do at least need to know what components are and one or two more things. So here are a couple of vectors and here are some axes and I haven't even put units on because perhaps these are abstract vectors and we're not even talking about positions and displacements. How do you read these vectors off of the pictures? Let's start with this A. This A is defined by two components, and I'm going to draw what they are here and here. We would call this distance along here the X component of A, and we would call this vertical distance here the y component of A. Now notice I've put a vector symbol on A because it is a vector. I haven't put vector symbols on the components. They aren't vectors, they're scalars. Well what are AX and AY? You can probably see AX is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And AY, well A points downwards and Y is increasing in the positive direction upwards, so AY must be negative. And so AX is 5 and AY is negative 3. And we can now write A this way. I would write it as 5 and this funny I symbol with a hat on it, minus 3 and this funny J with a hat on it. Okay, those might look intimidating, but there's no need for them to be intimidating. This I hat just means in the positive X direction. And this J hat just means in the positive Y direction. So you just read this five in the positive I direction and minus three in the positive Y direction. You may have learned to write a vector like this as an ordered pair, like so or perhaps using angle brackets instead of round brackets. That's fine. Um, also, because here the labels tell you which component is which, there's nothing wrong with reversing their order. You could write it this way. But if you use this notation, it's the order that tells you the first one is the x component and the second one is the y component. Note, many students would look at this vector and incorrectly say, that its x component is 6 and its y component is 2. Do you see why they would say that? That's where the end is, isn't it? But that's not what we care about. What we care about is how far over and down this vector carries us. So similarly this b, I hope you can see, is negative 2 i hat plus 3 j hat. Now let's use this to find a relationship between positions and displacements. So here are two position vectors. And for a position vector, you can just look at where the end is because the tail is always at the origin. And maybe this is the source of confusion for some students. So this ri is 6i hat plus 3j hat. And this rf is So what's delta r, the displacement? What we'd like to do is see why I insist on calling it delta r, which seems to indicate that it's a change. Well, 
you can see that it is the change in position because it points from where the thing started to where the thing ended. And so it's describing how the location of the object changed. But does that mean we can calculate it the way we know how to calculate any old change as a final minus an initial? Well, let's have a look. Look at the components of this delta r. You can just read them right off. It has an x component of negative 4, and it has a y component of plus 2. Okay, notice if you take the final minus the initial x components, 2 minus 6, oh look, you get negative 4. And if you take the final minus the initial y components, you get 2. And so we can see that the components obey that delta rx, which we'll just call delta x, is just x final minus x initial. And delta ry, which we'll just call delta y, is just yf minus yi. So this certainly looks like we can just say that delta r is r final minus r initial. Let's see this another way, because there's a way of understanding this just from drawing. Let's just think of these two arbitrary vectors and what it means to add them. The way we interpret addition of vectors is that you start at the tail of 1. So imagine starting at the tail of A and walking to its head. And then if you paste the tail of B on there, and walk on to the head of B, you have now walked a vector which we interpret as A plus B. So this is in fact the meaning of adding these two vectors A plus B. Well now what does subtracting mean? Suppose instead that we wanted to subtract B from A. So here's A again, but let me point out that A minus B ought to be the same as A plus negative B. Well, what's negative B? Well, negative B is the thing you would add to B to get zero. So it must be just like B, but pointing back in the opposite direction. So that now gives us our way of doing a vector subtraction. You take the one you're subtracting from the other, flip it end for end, and now just go ahead and add them. And now you have come up with the subtraction here, a minus b. So with that in mind, go back and look at this, and you can see if you take rf, and you subtract ri from it, in other words, you draw the vector that is negative ri starting from the head of rf, that means you have to come over this way 6 and down 3, so there would be negative ri, then the vector that you draw in as a result here if you compare it, is exactly the same as this delta r. And so you can see that we got delta r by subtracting rf minus ri. So let's see this with my motion across the room that we've been looking at as an example. I've superimposed two images so that you can see some initial and final position, and I've drawn in the displacement vector between them. And no notice, as we expect, if I redefine where the axes are, the position vectors have changed, but the displacement vector hasn't. And the other thing to notice is that if I copy those vectors down below and flip the ri around, you can see that rf plus negative ri gives delta r.
So let's see how those same ideas play out in a position versus time graph. Here's the position versus time graph we got last lecture. And if I just pick two moments in time, I can read off the x components of position, right? That's what the vertical axis is showing here, x component of position. And I can just read those two x components off. And then the displacement, or rather the x component of the displacement, is just the difference between them. You can see how if I subtract xi from xf, I'll get that x component of displacement. But if I move the axes, in other words, if I redefine where x is 0, both of those x components of position have changed, but the x component of the displacement has remained the same as we expect it to. Before we get to velocity, I need to point something out about time, and it's that it works sort of the same way. If we look at the times of those two instants that I picked on the previous graph, we can label them tf and ti, and we can read them off of the time axis. And there is some time interval, a difference in time, which we would just get by tf by ti. But our choice of when time was zero was totally arbitrary. And so I could redraw my axes this way so that I've redefined when time is zero. Now note, both of those times have changed, but the delta t, the time interval, hasn't. And so just as we expect displacements to be more useful than positions, we should expect time intervals to be more useful than times. We're finally ready to tackle speed and velocity. So let's think about driving from Sydney to Halifax, which many of you will have done. Google Maps tells me that's 404 kilometers, and for me, that drive would take about five and a half hours. So we can say that my average speed would be 404 kilometers divided by 5.5 hours, and that's 73.5 kilometers per hour. Well, does that mean I went 73.5 kilometers per hour the whole way? Well, certainly not. As I was driving through Sydney, the police would have been awfully annoyed with me if I was going that fast. And on the stretch of the Trans-Canada between New Glasgow and Truro, everyone else would have been extremely annoyed with me if I was driving at that speed. The point is, this is the average. And aside from just thinking about speed, this also gives us a way of thinking about what average means. It's the constant value that would have the same effect as an actual varying value. The speed I was actually going was varying. But if I had gone at a constant 73.5 kilometers per hour, it would have had the same effect. I would have got from Sydney to Halifax in the same amount of time assuming the police didn't pull me over. There are a lot of things about motions that we can just see by looking at graphs. So here is a position versus time graph. This is the x component of my position as I walk across the room. And I'm starting at x equals 1 and I'm ending at x equals 5. And the first one I'm going at what is for me a fairly relaxed walking pace. And you see I go 4 meters, right, from 1 to 5 in a time of three seconds. Now suppose I do the same thing, I start at one meter again, but I walk half as fast. Well, it should take me twice as long to go the same distance. So this graph here is me walking half as fast and taking six seconds to walk four meters. So this shows us right away, because the main difference between these is their slope, that a steeper slope means faster. And so that's something we can just see looking at a graph. The next thing to notice is that on this one, if you look at these two time intervals, which are the same time interval, I go the same displacement. And so that's saying in equal times, I'm going equal distance, I must be going at a constant speed. And that's resulting in a constant slope. So this is how you recognize constant speed motion. If the slope is constant, then the speed is constant, and that's going to result in a position versus time graph that is a straight line. So that sets us up for next lecture where one of the main messages is going to be that the slope of the x component of position graph versus time is the x component of the velocity.